Welcome everyone. Um, Saeb holds the Smith Memorial Lecture in memory of um, Professor JLB Smith and Margaret Mary Smith every year in September. JLB Smith was the only marine fish researcher in Grahamstown when Rhodes established the Department of Ichthyology in 1946. And it was only after his death in 1968 that Margaret Smith orchestrated the establishment of the JLB Smith Institute. When, with the building we are in today officially opening on the 26th of September 1977, which was Margaret's birthday when she turned 61, and it would have been the, 80, um, the 80th birthday of JLB Smith. Fish research and um, postgraduate teaching and supervision really took off under Margaret's directorship, and I'm sure that the Smiths would be immensely proud of where Saib is today, not only as a fish research institute, but as an aquatic biodiversity institute with global reach. The Smith Memorial Lecture is held every year um, on this date, or in September, sorry, and it was held every year except for 2020 during the pandemic. And this is our first year where we have a hybrid event after two online lectures in 2021 and 2022. This form format allows us to reach a much larger audience, and I would like to welcome everyone who is here today and everyone who's joining us remotely from across South Africa and globally. I would also like to extend a special thanks to our friends from DIFFS who supported this event and sponsored the eats and refreshments. So um, I would just give, like to give some house rules quickly before I introduce Alan. So um, please can everybody turn their phones um, onto silent and um, at the end of Alan's talk I'll be taking questions first from the, the people on the floor and then from the Zoom audience. And the Zoom audience, you can either ask um, questions in the chat or you can put your hand up and ask a question online. So today it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Alan Whitfield to give the 2023 Smith Memorial Lecture. Alan is a leading authority on estuarine ichthyology and he's played such an important role in my life, both as a mentor and an inspiration. And I know that our MD Angus, um, Paul Cowley and many other estuarine scientists will feel the same. Not only is Alan an inspiration as a scientist, but he is one of the nicest people you could meet and the most humble people that you would meet. Um, in the words of Paul Cowley, he says, Alan is an absolute legend. <laughs> so Alan grew up in Durban, like me, and after completing his PhD at the University of, of KwaZulu-Natal, um, so he got a job as a research officer with Rhodes University based in Sedgefield. Sorry, Alan, but this was while you were doing your PhD. <laughs> Um, he then moved to the JLB Smith Institute of Ichthyology as a senior ichthyologist in 1987. And from 1995, he was the Institute's assistant director and principal scientist, and later the chief scientist, and he is now SIAB's emeritus chief scientist. Alan has been honored with many awards throughout his career, such as the Gilchrist Memorial Medal um, for his contributions to South African marine science, and the Sussex um, Gold Medal for his contributions to African aquatic science. He was rated an NRF um, A-rated scientist in 2007. So this means that he was recognized as a global um, leader in the field of estuarine ecology, and he is still a global leader. And in the same year, he was um, inducted as a fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa. Alan is one of, also one of the only few scientists who holds a um, senior doctorate from Rhodes University. And during his career, he's published an astounding 240 papers and um, book chapters and delivered more than 120 conference presentations. In terms of the number of um, estuarine publications written by South African scientists, Alan, Alan is the leader and he's um, continued to be the leader in, uh, in estuarine publications. Alan has been more productive in retirement than many of us salaried scientists. <laughs> Um, and after retire, retiring in 2019, Alan published a major synthesis of the bio, biology and ecology of fishes in South African estuaries. So this synthesis and the earlier book that Alan wrote are used by estuarine um, fish ecologists like myself almost on a daily basis. In two, um, 2022, Alan was a lead author and editor of a global two-volume book entitled Fish and Fisheries and Estuaries. And then the next year, so now, Alan um, is going to be telling us about another book that he was the lead author and editor of, entitled Nisner Estuary, Jewel of the Garden Route. So this book is the perfect top topic for today's lecture because the, um, the Smiths bought the pristine western head of, of Nisner and the Featherbed, Featherbed Bay at Nisner, 
which received heritage status in 1987. So the book introduces readers to the structure, functioning and importance of the estuaries with, chapter written, with chapters written by experts in their field. So every cent of the purchase price of the book will go towards supporting research and conservation of the Nisner estuaries. Estuary, sorry. Copies of the book are 980 Rand um, without postage and packaging and can be bought from um, Jessica Seath at the Nisner, Nisner Basin project. So Alan asked me to say that he has several books with him today which buyers can buy without having to pay for postage. With that, please join, join me in warmly welcoming Alan this evening and we look forward to hearing about your, uh, about your book. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, Nikki, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Lucky Lamini for inviting me to present the Smith Memorial Lecture. It's a great honor. Um, and I'd also like to thank the staff of SAIB for preparing for this evening um, for everyone. I'm going to start the um, lecture off We have the first slide. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, I've got a few slides in the beginning which highlight the Smiths and their involvement um, in Neisner. This is a picture of JLB Smith um, having a holiday in Neisner. He used to go down to Neisner to relax. Um, and <laughs> um, when he and Margaret had been to Mozambique, they had a big expedition which lasted several weeks. They'd been catching thousands and thousands of fish and they got back to Grahamstown. And he said to, to Margaret that he was really tired and, and he needed to go on holiday to Nyasna to go fishing. <laughs> a lot of the pictures you see him with that were taken at Nyasna, they, they all contain a white steenbrus, which is quite interesting because the white steenbrus is one of the species that I'll talk about a bit later and is, is actually a threatened species and has declined in abundance quite considerably, but J.L.B. Smith sort of, certainly caught a large number of these. On the, on the jetty next to him there, you see a dog looking towards you. That um, was a dog called Marlin, and Marlin used to go out with J.L.B. Smith when he fished at the Nisner SG. You'll also notice that in his left hand, he's carrying a pith helmet. Um, both Margaret and J.L.B used to wear pith helmets. Now, I'm not sure, but a lot of the scientists and people, outdoor people, farmers in those days used to wear pith helmets, which to me looked rather heavy. And I'm not sure why they chose that sort of headgear um, to wear. And I've never seen anybody wearing a pith helmet in the last two decades. <laughs> now, this little incident that occurred at their house. So JLB was standing in front of their house in that previous slide. The photograph was probably taken by Margaret. I must tell you a little bit about John Day so that you can put this practical joke into context. John Day um, was a professor of zoology at the University of Cape Town uh, before the war, the Second World War. And he then signed up uh, in the Second World War and he became a fighter pilot. Um, his fighter jet, or well not jet, fighter aeroplane was shot down and he actually lost a leg and he had a, an artificial leg and came back to the university after the war and carried on his work. And he decided that he was going to work in estuaries, even though he had one artificial leg. And those of you who walked in estuaries, it's not very easy to do, even with two legs. But he gathered around him a group of scientists from the University of Cape Town and students and one of the places that they went to quite early on was the Nisner estuary. And um, he and the students and some of his colleagues would work mainly on the invertebrates, but it was on the ecology of the estuary as a whole. They'd also catch fish, and he would generally send the fish to J.L.B. Smith, who did the identification of the fish for him. This particular incident is quite interesting because 
that house was painted as John Day describes, a brilliant blue, and it was supposedly to keep the mosquitoes away. It's almost certain that John Day and all the students were responsible for whitewashing it. The interesting thing is the house today is painted white. It's not the same house that JLB lived in. It's a five-star accommodation, and it is called the estuary. And the, 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 the jetty that you saw, saw JLB standing on probably now 80 years old, it's still there. So the house has changed completely, but the jetty is still there. Okay, what are the origins of this book? This is the brainchild of Mark Reed. Now, Mark Reed is an old Neisner family person. His grandparents, his parents had a holiday home on Leisure Isle. So Mark spent a lot of time in Neisner and still does. And Mark was continually being confronted with people asking questions and discussing topics on the estuary for which they didn't have the information. And he decided that it would be a good idea if the various studies that had been done on the estuary by a large number of different scientists working in different disciplines, but not necessarily together, if they got together and actually compiled a book which would be available to the public and available to people to gain knowledge and become empowered on what was going on in the estuary. So he set about asking Charles Breen, who was uh, chairman of the Nyasden Basin Project, if he knew of a person who would be able to coordinate such a book and he would find the sponsorship for the book, which he did, 20 sponsors, each immediately contributed enough money to cater for the publishing of the book. And Charles came up with my name. I knew Charles from a long way back. In fact, in 1972, Charles was my botany ecology lecturer at the University of Natal, now the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So he knew me from then, and he also knew me from the time when he became involved in estuarine uh, work in South Africa where we worked together on estuarine management uh, projects together. And he also knew that I'd spent eight years down in the Southern Cape, quite near to Nysna. And so he said, would, Alan, would you like to take this project on? And I said, yes, immediately. So the book, we, dr we drafted the various chapters we were going to come up with, and we then approached various experts. So there are lots of experts in these different fields. Many of them don't actually talk to people in other disciplines. In other words, they're very focused on their disciplines. They're great experts in their area, but not on the, uh, on the estuary as a whole. So the objective of this book was to come up with a synthesis or uh, information available on all these different disciplines and then try and tie it together in a way which made sense for anybody reading the book. We also had a, a foreword, which George Branch very kindly agreed to write. So the book contains a very nice foreword from George. Um, the other person who was very critical in the production of this book was Susan Abraham, who uh, is from Cape Town. She's a graphics artist, and she is very adept at um, typesetting, collating, doing indexing, and so she was a key role player. Once the chapters started coming in, she was a key role player in putting this book together and, and producing it. Even uh, uh, the, the cover of the book, which was um, compiled by um, um, Mark Reed's wife, Christine, together with Susan, um, and you can see that that cover wraps around. It's a photograph by Duran de Villiers, um, an aerial photograph, a number of his photographs, he's from Neisner, are featured in the book. And one of the, the criteria that I gave to the authors of the, the lead authors of the different chapters, every lead author, when I approached them, all of them accepted straight away. There was no hesitation, which shows the commitment to this particular book um, by, the, by the authors. But I said to them, I said, look, I don't want this to be written for scientists. It must be written so that the public can understand it. And it mustn't be text heavy. It must have lots of photographs, figures, tables, and that, which people can understand. 
and they delivered. So those are the 12 chapters. We also included, um, apart from an index, um, we included uh, two appendices, one of which is all the species of known plants, invertebrates, fishes, and birds from Nyasta. And the second appendix basically consists of a, a series of photographs of very rare and iconic uh, species from Nyasna that have been recorded there, but not in very large numbers necessarily, and are not featured in the various chapters. So that was an additional um, um, feature of the book. Okay, I'm going to use photographs from the book in, in illustrating each chapter, not necessarily in order, um, uh, because if I did all, all the photographs, you'd be here until tomorrow morning. Um, and this particular chapter, which is a foundational chapter, is on the evolution of the Nice Nestry, so it traces the the evolution of the estuary over about the last 200,000 years. And you'll, this is a picture taken from the eastern head, looking towards the western head, and you're looking out towards the sea to the south of Nasna. Now, if I told you that 20,000 years ago, which is not very long ago, if you were standing in that exact position, there was no estuary there. There was a river flowing through the heads, or the narrows as the Smiths called it, out onto a plain, a terrestrial plain. So that was all land. There was no sea in that picture. The Nisner estuary was 80 kilometers to the south. So you wouldn't be able to see the Nisner estuary from the top of the heads. So it was a very different environment 20,000 years ago. And this, this, these two graphs here show what's happened over the, the period running the, the right hand graph goes from 160,000 um, years ago to the present and you'll say you'll see there was a last interglacial now these geologists they call it an interglacial it should actually be a really hot period okay and during that period the water level in Nisna and around the world was about eight meters above what it is today and then there was a cooling that took place between 120,000 years ago and 20,000 years ago. So in that right-hand graph, you'll see there, last glacial maximum. And that's when there were massive ice sheets all over northern Europe, Asia, North America. These ice sheets were kilometers thick, and that water came out of the sea. So the sea had dropped by 120 meters below where we are today, and that's the situation I described to you just now. After that, we went into a global warming period. So from 20,000 years ago up until about 8,000 years ago. Now, if you look at the left-hand graph, that shows you the last 20,000 20, years. And you can see that the last glacial maximum is down there at 120. And then it rapidly goes up with a couple of little steps where maybe the, the, the global warming slowed down a bit and the ice didn't melt so fast. And it went up to the normal, or put it this way, the present day sea level about seven or 8,000 years ago. And it leveled off at that level. And we're now in a global, continuing to have global warming. So in the next 1,000 years, we could go back up to that eight or nine meters above mean sea level, which would be the same as what it was 120,000 years ago. One of the interesting evidence of how the Nisner estuary has changed. This is the Nisner Chuchu that used to run between George and Nisner. And when they laid the, the pylons for that bridge, which the, the train is on, into the, into the sediment, they wanted to hit bedrock so, the, the, so that the pylons were secure. And they went down to 24 meters, and all they hit was sand and mud. So what had happened here over the last 20,000 years, this was a river valley 20,000 years ago, and then with the rise in sea level and the flooding of the Nisner estuary and the sedimentation that occurred there, the Nisner estuary filled up with sediment, and hence they couldn't hit the bedrock for that bridge, but they still built it. Okay, we also wanted to include the ancient occupation of, of the Nisner estuary by both hominins and homo sapiens. And the stone tools, which are the visiting cards that these people left behind, go back a million years. Okay, so the early stone tools, which has been held in that top left-hand picture, that's a very 
large, it's not a hand axe, it's something you'd operate with two hands, you'd probably use it for, for bashing um, animals, big animals that you wanted to chop open. As the um, stone uh, working became more sophisticated towards the Middle Stone Age, you had hand axes being produced, like in the top right-hand corner, that's a hand axe, which was probably produced about 100,000, 150,000 years ago. And as the skills improved, the, the stone tools became more and more sophisticated. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a spear, a stone spear, the, the, the tip of the spear has been broken off. Each, all of these things have been found at the Nisna on the Western Heads. Um, and obviously the, the wooden shaft of the spear no longer exists, but the stone uh, spearhead does exist. Next to that sp stone spear, you have a stone which was used for the, the receiving of the orca um, uh, die, which, or stone material which was ground up as a powder and then used for painting on faces and things like that of the people for, for ornamental purposes. Um, and that's a broken base of, of, of what was used. In the bottom left-hand corner are a whole lot of broken ostrich shells. And the ones on the right-hand side you can see are, black, are rather the blackish color. And that's because they were um, affected by the fire that the people used in the cave. So this is a painting um, which shows what life was like on that Paleogullus plain. 20,000 years ago, so the sea is now quite far away. Um, and the interesting thing is there were many animals that were present on that Agullus, Paleogullus plain that are extinct. So for example, if you look in the background but, but behind those two chaps carrying a blau book, which is now also extinct, it was existed when Jan van der Rebeke arrived at the Cape, but the, the settlers soon shot the Blaubock out and it became extinct, but on the Paleogullus plain it would have been present and they, they are about to cook it for supper. But in the background, just behind the shoulder of the, right, of the man on the right, you will see two big buffalo. Now these were buffalo that were far bigger than the buffalo today. They were a longhorn buffalo and to give you an idea of the size of the horn, the two ladies that are sitting on the right hand side, they're busy so sorting uh, corms or bulbs of, of, of plants which they're going to use in their supper. Um, you'll see a horn behind the right-hand lady, and that's a horn of the uh, longhorn buffalo. The fire in the bottom right-hand side, you'll see some of the seafoods that they ate, and they, they left a lot of the shells, so we actually know what the, the, the people were eating at that time. On the left-hand side, you'll see two young ladies, one of whom um, there's a grinding uh, place there where they've prepared the orca for putting on the face. Initially, they put the powder in the two abalone shells near her right foot. It's then mixed with liquid in that, <coughs> and then she's applying it onto the skin of, of the, the, the lady facing her. The children are bringing firewood for the fire, and in the background, you can see some of the other animal species that were present on the Paleogullus Plain 20,000 years ago. Yes. I that, thought those would have all been covered by forest rainfall. Yeah. Uh, um, I think it was the person who painted this is Maggie Newman. Um, it's her interpretation <laughs> that they were, the forest would have been definitely further inland because the Nisner forests are ancient forests and they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, one of the chapters is devoted to tracks cast in stone. Now, this is not just human tracks, it's a whole lot of animal tracks. Um, there's a whole team of scientists that have been working on this for quite some time, published a large number of papers. And one of the footprints that is cast in stone in a cave uh, near Brenton on Sea, which is just next to Neisner, is shown in the top left hand corner. Um, the other really interesting find that um, Charles Helm and his colleagues came up with are the first use of shoes by humans in the world. So these shoes, 
date to, uh, and these are the imprints of the shoes. The shoes have obviously gone because they're made of leather and they disintegrate. But the tracks made by the shoes are imprinted in the sand and the sand is then converted into an aeolianite, which is a stone. Um, and there you can see the print. So this is the first use of shoes somewhere between 80,000 and 150,000 years ago. Um, the, the, the figure on the bottom right is just to give you depth using color. It's the same Im image as the one on the left. Charles and his colleagues have also found prints of everything, elephants, rhinos, um, in this case, crocodiles. So there you see some prints of crocodiles of the feet. They've also found traces of the tail of a crocodile as it moves through shallow water. So when the crocodile moves, it leaves a, 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 a wavy line in the, in the sand, which then becomes stone and preserves the, 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 cro the fact that crocodiles were there. So the crocodiles would have been there 120,000 years ago. Remember, that was when it was very hot in Nasna. Okay, As soon as it began cooling after that 120,000 years ago, it would eventually become too cold for the crocodiles and they would have disappeared. So they might have disappeared maybe 70, 80,000 years ago, never to return. Although if we have global warming back to what it was 120,000 years ago, maybe the crocodiles will come back. The right-hand picture, so not only do we have around the Nisner estuary pictures or evidence of early occupants from 100,000 years ago, we've also got evidence of the dinosaurs that were present around the Nisner lagoon. And that's a tooth, a therapsid dinosaur tooth that was um, picked up um, near the western heads. Um, and it, it's a dinosaur which is similar to Tyrannosaurus rex, but a different species, probably smaller. Um, and you can see it's like a steak knife. And it's, it's a predatory dinosaur. And they were wandering around the Nisna estuary um, 100 million years ago. Okay, the hydrodynamics of Nisna is fairly unique. It's what we call an estuarine bay. So it has a very big inflow of marine water every tide, on neap tides as well as on spring tides. And this strong connectivity with the estuary means that a lot of marine species that you don't normally find in estuaries are found in fairly high abundance and diversity in the Nisna estuary. And that includes both invertebrates and fishes. There's a view looking now to the southeast from inside the Nisner estuary. You can see the main channel going out to the head, through the heads in the, in the top middle of the picture. Um, the channels tend to be fairly sandy, and the depth is normally two, three, maybe four meters. It gets deeper as you go towards the heads. At the heads, the depth can actually get up to 15 meters in depth, but it's also much narrower. The submerged dark plants you see there are, are submerged seagrass beds, and these Salt marsh beds, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, are greenish. They intertidal. Right, so what about the seagrass beds? The dominant seagrass in Nisna is the eelgrass. This is an endemic southern African uh, species of Zostra, Zostra capensis. So it's named after the cape. Um, and this, these plant beds are very important for both invertebrates and fishes in the estuary. Um, and are utilized um, extensively. In fact, the, 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 the eelgrass beds in the Nisner estuary are the largest of any estuary in, in South Africa. So they're a major um, haven for the, the, the eelgrass stock in Southern Africa. The salt marsh habit, habitat in, in, in Nisner is very extensive. There you can see a lovely zonation with different species at different tidal levels. Um, and, and these salt marshes are, occur all around the estuary, although in, in some parts of the estuary they're compromised by hard structures, such as you see on the right-hand side here, there's a wall. This is taken at high tide, so at low tide, the seagrass, the, the salt marsh is exposed, and this means that the salt marsh will survive. But with sea level rise, that those plants will be permanently underwater. They won't be able to extend to the landward side because there's now a wall stopping them from going inland and they will disappear. They will die in this particular section of, of the estuary. 
Now, the, the invertebrate fauna in the estuary, that's, this is the richest of any estuary in South Africa. So niacin is number one. There are many species of these invertebrates that we, even some of the common ones, that we don't know what species they are. And there's even, you can see the top two there, Asaminian hydrobia. They've got little asterisks around them, which indicates that this is the genus we think they belong to but they have ne never not been formally described as such. There are also numerous other species for which we know nothing about, and I think in terms of finding new species, Nisna still is a treasure trove. Bait organisms are very important to fishermen, both subsistence fishermen and recreational fishermen, and they are heavily exploited. The ones that are of particular concern are the two on the right, the, the bloodworm, Arunicola, and um, the one in the lower um, centre, uh, Polybrachiorhynchus. Its species name is called Dayai, which is after Professor John Day. He, he, it was named in honour of him. But these invertebrates are extensively utilised and intensively utilised. This is an area of Nisner which is supposedly a reserve, so bo no bait collecting is allowed, but you can see digging is taking place there, probably to try and get the ribbon worm. Um, there's also some prawn pumping taking place, which is a legal way of obtaining bait. You can also see a boat track running along from the centre bottom towards the... Uh, so obviously at high tide there was a boat that went along here and just chopped up um, the zostra bed. So the zostra bed is being destroyed by these sort of activities. If, if people obey the law, then there will be um, bait for, for everyone. But if this sort of thing expands and continues, it's not going to happen forever. To give you an example of why the zostra beds are important, this shows you this fish species that tend to associate with the different types of habitats in the Nisner estuary. So on the left-hand side, you see the species that are associated mainly with dense eelgrass beds. In the centre, the species that are mainly associated with patchy or sparse eelgrass beds. And on the right, the species that are associated with bare, sandy or muddy areas. Incidentally, the blacktail, which is shown in the left-hand picture, that was the first fish that J.L.B. Smith caught as a little boy. And he, he never forgot it. And he's, it's a very special fish to him. He caught it at Nisna. There are also a high diversity of sharks and rays in Nisner, more so than any other estuary in, 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 South, in South Africa. So there are more than 100 fish species in the estuary, and there's more than a dozen sharks and rays. And this is just one of the, one of the um, uh, Elasma branks, the ray. Um, it's the blue ray, the stingray, which comes into the estuary. The, the, the picture on the right there, you can see a whole lot of dark, shady, blobs on the, under the water. Those are blue stingrays, and they come into the estuary during summer, probably to pup and maybe to mate. This, in my opinion, is the iconic species of Nisner, not everybody says the Nisner seahorse is the iconic one. To me, the, the white stingray is the iconic one and the most important species for everyone. It's important to recreational anglers, subsistence anglers, and it's an important endemic species that occurs only in South Africa. I'll talk a little bit about it just now. Here you can see where, what the status is of, of the white stem brush. So both the dusky cob, which is in the upper, the, the top one, and the, the white stem brush is the one below, they're classified by the U, U, IUCN as being endangered. In the case of the dusky cob, the stocks are down to between 1% and 5% of the original spawn stock biomass. In the case of the steam brass, it's down to 6%. In other words, we've lost 94% of the stock. So clearly, we have to do something to replenish or enable these stocks to replenish themselves. Because if they replenish themselves, there'll be more fish for everyone. But if this trend continues, you will have at the end of the day, extirpation from individual systems, and maybe Nisner will be one of them. This is the national figures, not the Nisner figures. The Nisner seahorse, as I said, is the iconic species for Nisner, and a lot of the logos of Nisner, they all have the seahorse. Um, it's one of the few seahorses in the world 
that actually has its whole life cycle in an estuary. They're also a bit like a chameleon. They can change color um, according to the background. Initially, it was thought that they um, were dependent on the eelgrass beds, and therefore one of the reasons to conserve the eelgrass beds was because these seahorses used that, them to attach their tails to in order to, to um, stay in one position and not be swept out by the tide or in by the tide. The picture on the left is a mussel bed in the Nisner estuary. This is a mussel that is actually a foreign mussel from Europe, Mytilus gala provincialis. And you can see the, 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 the seahorse there is attaching its tail to one of the mussels. You also see there's some little red dots under the skin of the, the sea, that seahorse. These are little markers that Lo Klassen, who did her PhD on the Nisner seahorse, inserted so that she could track the movement of individual Neisner seahorses. So in order to know which seahorse it was and where it was going and whether it stayed in one place or not, the, some of the seahorses were marked and monitored. The seahorse on the right is attached to the wire of what is called a reno mattress. Now a reno mattress is a wire filled, it's a wire basket which is filled with rocks and boulders. And so the, when the marinas were built on Tyson Island and that, um, these, these uh, wire baskets were put to stabilize the banks. And the seahorses have adapted to that, and they now use it as a, as a, a part of their habitat. And so they've benefited from these man-made um, changes in the system. They're only a few inches. They're not very big. Um, so that sort of size maximum, um, very small. They don't grow very big. And as some of you will know, the males are the ones that actually give birth. OK, so what about the birds? Um, there are a wide variety of birds. Some of them have done well. Uh, they've got records now because of the bird uh, birders in the Nisen area. They do counts in summer and winter over the last few decades. So there's a lovely record going back for, for quite a long period. And from that, the authors of the bird chapter were able to identify which birds are increasing and which birds are decreasing. And i am just used three species as an example here. This is the African oyster catcher, which has increased. Um, so they also nest in the Nisen estuary. And this species has actually benefited around the coast. That, that mussel I told you about earlier is probably one of the reasons why the, the oyster catchers increased because they feed on this, this oyster, um, not the oysters, this mussel, um, and therefore they've got more food. Um, also, the vehicle ban on beaches probably also benefited the species because there was less disturbance and less uh, running over nests and so on. In the Nisner estuary, there's a fairly substantial population, and as I say, they've also been recorded breeding there. This is a sacred ibis in the Nisner nice, the, the nice, the salt marsh. This bird has also increased enormously in recent decades. And they've adapted to humans in quite an interesting way. Um, they know the rubbish days. And on the rubbish days, they will go and investigate the rubbish as to whether there's anything edible for them. And so that's, their food resource has also increased, and their numbers have gone up as well. So they're not only able to use the food in the estuary, they're also able to use our, our food or our waste food. Now, one that's a bit of a sad story, and it's not Neisner's fault that this, this particular species has declined. There used to be thousands of this species in the Neisner estuary, as, based on the earlier records, and there are now less than 50. So this is a Palearctic migrant. It spends our winter in the Northern Hemisphere, where it breeds, and then it flies all the way from the Northern Hemisphere down to the Southern Hemisphere to spend the summer here. It doesn't breed in, 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 in South Africa, but it occupies estuaries where it builds up uh, food reserves and that during our summer when the estuaries are most productive, and then off it goes back to, to Europe. But obviously it has to run a gauntlet between South Africa and Europe and Asia, and that process is obviously very challenging for the species, and that may well account for this big decline, not anything that's necessarily happened in the Nisner estuary. And this is the chapter on climate change, which Nikki led. Um, she's shown the, a small group of fishes coming from the tropics. So as the seas or the coastal waters heat up, 
those species are going to migrate down towards Neisner and they're going to displace the more endemic species which are shown down in the bottom of the picture. Examples of those are shown in the bottom of the picture. And some of the cool temperate species are shown in the left hand side of the picture. So those species are all going to be pushed towards the west as the tropical species advance. So species like the white steenbos and that may well be pushed out by species like the spotted grunter. And that could have consequences apart from the overexploitation of the steenbos. Um, it could, could also result in um, a reduced um, range for white steenbos in southern Africa. These are some of the summary points about what is going to happen in the different parts of the estuary as a result of climate change. And you can see that the upper estuary, the middle estuary, and the lower estuary have different impacts. There's a chapter on the management of the Nisner estuary, and you can see that over time, the situation in the Nisner estuary in terms of human impacts has changed quite considerably. There was a very big change that took place from about the 1950s onwards. And there's been closer and closer requirements for, for management of the estuary because of the increased human pressures on the system. And this is managed at the moment by sand parks. And they have developed various uh, management plans for the estuary. You can see the two latest ones were two, in 2004 um, and in 2012 with the final one being approved in 2020. So there's, they are very aware of their responsibilities. And it's, this Eisner is part of the Garden Route um, Conservation Area or National Park. And it's a very key area which the National Park take very seriously. Um, yeah. So two of the additional problems that are there in Eisner and are very um, that, that require dealing with from a management perspective is the wastewater treatment plant, which handles all our wastewater that comes from the homes in Nisna. And that's an outlet which is flowing into the Nisna estuary and it's introducing lots of nutrients into the estuary, um, which lead to blooms in various algae, which is not good for the estuary. And so that is going to require management attention in the future. Sedimentation is also a problem, particularly after heavy rains, as shown in this picture here, um, where you have f flooding and areas that are vulnerable to erosion, then go, the sediment goes into the estuary, causing an accentuated shallowing. The sand parks are very aware of engagement with communities uh, in the Nisen area who use the estuary, and this has happened really in the last couple of well, decade or so, um, when I lived in, in, in that area, um, the days there was no consultation between sand parks and people, whereas now that has changed. There is consultation, and so the management plans are drawn up in collaboration with the different interest groups. So that group on the left-hand side there are um, subsistence fishers who are interacting with the um, sand parks in order to indicate um, the way they think the estuary should be managed. Of course, the, the estuary means different things to different people. And I've shown a, a slide here which shows a subsistence fisherman on the left and a recreational fisherman on the right. Now, the recreational fisherman, that, that fish was released when it was, after it was caught. It wasn't kept. Whereas the subsistence fisherman would need that fish to feed his family, so he wouldn't release it. And that's understandable. So there needs to be a new way of thinking about how we manage these fish resources. Remember, the one that fish on the right is a dusky cob. The stock is down to 1% to 4% of what it was. So more than 95% has gone. So it's important that recreational fishermen do release these fish back to the, the sea or back to the estuary after they've caught them. So in all people who use the estuary, whether you are an artisanal fisherman or a recreational fisherman, the estuary develops a sense of place and a sense of meaning. And it's only if that sense of meaning becomes real that you can have a stewardship culture developing. Okay? So then you will find that people will not break rules if they feel that they have ownership and they have stewardship 
and respect for the environment and respect for the organisms that they're capturing so that they don't exceed their bad limit. So they stick within the size limits of fish that they keep. And that's something that needs to be inculcated through education and involvement between science and the public. And one of the ways that is suggested in the book is that we start a Nisner Basin partnership and we weave this in to a program for climate and global change. So we know there's global change, such as the wastewater going into the estuary. We know there's climate change as involved as, as sea level rise. Those are examples. Those need to be looked at carefully because remember, estuaries are naturally stressed environments for organisms living there, with salinities changing with tides and river flow. If we impose on top of that major changes in climate, and major changes in global impacts that we, we produce, then those organisms and plants are going to be threatened. I spoke about the appendices. Appendix one is the lists of all the different species found that we know of in the, in the, in the estuary. And the appendix, I've just chosen four species from that appendix. The one on the top left is the Cape Clawless Otter. It's a shy species, so you will only see it probably very early in the morning when there's no people around in certain places that are quiet. The one in the top right is an is a off African offspray. Um, they're normally there singly. They, they're also a migrant species, doesn't breed in South Africa. Um, and you will occasionally see a, a bird there. In the book, we've got some photographs of an osprey diving into the water at Nasna and catching a southern mullet. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is an argonaut. This is a pelagic octopus that lives in the ocean. This one was washed into the Nasna estuary. And you'll see that it's got an egg case. Now, that's not a shell. It's an egg case. So only the female argonaut has the egg case. It manufactures the egg case itself when it's ready to store its eggs. Um, and it's, it's very rare. Uh, I, I don't know of many instances where it's been recorded in the Nasna estuary. And in the bottom left-hand corner, um, th these are iconic species that people very seldom see. That photograph is actually taken in the Nisner estuary of, of cuttlefish, um, sepia. And they only occur in estuaries that are, in fact, um, uh, almost full seawater. So the bottom half of Nisner is very close to full seawater. They cannot withstand dilution due to river flow. If the river comes down in flood, the, the, the cuttlefish will leave the estuary and go, go to the sea and only come back when the salinity rises. Some species have been lost to the Nisner estuary, so I've spoken about the crocodiles that have gone uh, through natural processes, global cooling. The right-hand side, there's hippo. These hippo bones have been found at Nisner, and, and the hippos were in the Nisner estuary 300 years ago before the hunters arrived with their rifles, and then the hippo were gone. And then finally, I mentioned there are lots and lots of invertebrate species that have never been described, and many of them probably never been discovered. This is a little blenny that uh, was photographed by Low Classens in the Nisner estuary. We don't have a specimen, we have a photograph. We don't know what it is. It's a, probably a parablenius of some sort, but without a specimen, we can't identify whether it has been described before or whether it is, in fact, a new species. So even with the fish, Nisner can pop up these gems in the future. And that is a photograph, another photograph, the same as the cover photograph. This is a photograph by Durand de Villiers of a sunset over the Nisner estuary. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alan, for telling us about that amazing book. Um, I'm first going to take qu questions from the floor. Okay. Um, can you please speak into the mic for the okay, um, Zoom? I'm just concerned, uh, wondering about the conservation uh, status of the Kenton estuary, because that's one of our favorite places in Grahams, from Grahamstown. Thanks, Irene. Um, <clears throat> the Kenton estuary has different issues to the Nisner estuary. So each estuary actually, you have to look at it like individual people. They're not the same. They, uh, <clears throat> they have different 
different problems, different pressures. Um, so hypersalinity is a big issue in, in the Eastern Cape estuaries and the lack of freshwater flow from the catchments. That's not the case in Neisner. So the Neisner catchment doesn't have a major dam on it. Um, it's got weirs for supplying fresh water to Neisner, but there are no major dams. So that's not an issue there. So there are differences, but there are also similarities. So overfishing would be one similarity. Yeah. So you don't know so much about the Well, I'd, I'd need to give another oh, talk on okay. the Kintley <laughs> history. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Alan. That was great. I really enjoyed that. Um, in terms of the elasma branks, we might have solved, well, in a couple of years' time, we might solve the, the story behind the blue stingrays aggregating, because we've currently got a telemetry study on the blue stingrays there. We tagged 10 females and 5 males um, within that aggregation, and it'll be a three-year project. So we're looking at our first year download coming up October now. So hopefully we'll have some more answers for you. And then um, there's also another nice phenomenon with the spotted grunter that aggregate and spawn here in, yes. in the estuary. Mm. So hopefully we can tag some grunter there too and find out more about that. So yeah, fill in some blanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Taryn. Anybody else? Um, okay, so I'll go to the, the Zoom questions. Nikki, can you put them on the screen, please? Okay, so anybody online who's got questions, can you post them in the chat? <laughs> you got off lightly, Alan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> can you please ask your question? Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, Alan, congratulations. Uh, Fantastic talk and a great book. This kind of standard we expect from you. Um, and interestingly, you know, in the series almost, from the Maputland book to the field guide to the Eastern Cape Coast and now the Neisner Estuary. Um, my question to you is, what is the current status um, in the Neisner Estuary and worldwide of, of the Neisner Seahorse conservation status? It's all, uh, hi Mike, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's also a threatened species. It's limited in its distribution to three estuaries in the Southern Cape. So it occurs nowhere else in South Africa or the world. Um, and as I said, it's, a, it's an estuarine species confined to estuaries. So if we don't look after that seahorse in particularly the nice estuary, because that's its stronghold, then I anticipate that the, the, the Nasna nice, uh, seahorse would, 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 would be in a very, very difficult position because the populations in uh, Swatfle and Kyrbums are not nearly as substantial as the Nasna estuary and therefore not as sustainable in terms of the long term and from a genetics perspective as well. Most important thing that people who live and work uh, and, and do conservation work in the Neisner estuary can do to uphold the ecological integrity of the Neisner uh, lagoon. Correct. Thank you, Alan. Um, I can't see any more questions, am I? In that case, thank you so much, Alan. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. I, I'm not sure what the, the format is now. I, I think everyone can have drinks and snacks. <laughs> and buy a book, yes. 